So hello everybody, my name is Sarah Haig, I'm a Professor of Materials in the University of Manchester and the title of my talk today is Nano Exploring with Electron Microscopy, Seeing the Invisible. Before I start I want to thank all of the people that have contributed to this work, particularly the slides that I'm going to show you, that includes people that work in graphene, others that are in electron microscopy or those that work in my group or in the EM Centre here at Manchester. So I wanted to start by introducing some of the highlights that Manchester has to offer. I'm fortunate in working in the National Graphene Institute, which is this building shining here in black. We're on the campus of the University of Manchester, which is shown here. This is a picture of one of our large buildings called the Sackville Street Building. And this is a statue of Archimedes having inspiration as he leaps out of his bath in a eureka moment. And we're embedded with a very vibrant city. So this is the town hall at the University of Manchester during the Christmas markets. And as I say, many very well equipped labs and I'll show you some of those as we go through. So the structure of this talk is about uh, looking at things that are not visible by optical microscopy. I'm just going to start by considering why we want to see things that are very small. And then I'll talk a little bit about how we use electron microscopy to do that. So why would we want to see invisible things? And this is an example of that. This is an image which shows that small things can have huge impacts, or at least it, has, it shows a small thing that has had huge impacts. And many of you may recognize it, particularly these small round bits here. And these are the coronavirus. If we zoom in, we can see an enlarged or magnified view of one of these coronavirus particles. And they have these characteristic spike proteins. So the diameter of the coronavirus is just 120 nanometers. So they're really very small, too small to see with an optical microscope. But they've had huge impact, as we all know, in this time. So I wanted to focus in this talk really rather than about biology, about material science and thinking about why we'd want to see things in materials that are smaller than you can see with an optical microscope. And I think there are two main reasons for that. The first is that the atomic structure of a material, so the way that the atoms are behaved, determines how that material performs or its properties. An example of that would be comparing these two materials here. They're both made of the same type of atoms. They're both purely carbon, but in, diamonds, the carbon atoms are arranged in this three-dimensional tetrahedral structure, whereas in graphite they're arranged in these hexagonal layers that are then stacked up on top of each other. And that gives hugely different properties. We can see that the diamond is ultra hard, whereas graphite, for example, is relatively soft. Indeed, you can slide the planes off each other relatively easily. And that property is exploited when you write with a pencil. When you write with a pencil, the sheets of graphite are exfoliated onto the paper, leaving a black line. The other reason that we might want to see things that are very small in material science is that when a material is made very small, the properties can change. Specifically, it must be made very small in one dimension. So an example of that is shown here, or two examples. The first is, for example, gold. Gold is a boldy colour when it's uh, large millimetre size pieces, as you can see here. Whereas when we make a gold particle just a few nanometers or tens of nanometers in diameter, the properties change dramatically. And the obvious one you can see here is the color. The color here, this is a solution of gold nanoparticles and it's red. We can also get solutions of gold nanoparticles that are purple or slightly greeny or yellow. And all of those determined by the size of the gold nanoparticle and how that gold nanoparticle is interacting with the light. Second example, again, I'm looking at graphite. This is a slightly prettier piece of graphite. And as we exfoliate, not just a piece of graphite, but an individual plane, that individual atomic plane is known as graphene and it has very different properties. And I'll come into talking about the properties of graphene at the end of this talk. Okay, so how small do we want to see? Um, we can rephrase that question into thinking about how big is an atom? Now, to put this into context, if we think about human hair, a human hair is about 50 micrometers across. And this is a scanning electron microscope image showing a human hair, and this is the diameter of the hair. 
Now, if an atom is about 0.2 nanometers in diameter, and a human hair is about 50,000 nanometers wide, we can divide one by the other, and you can work out that the human hair is about a quarter of a million atoms in diameter, about 250,000 atoms wide. To put that into context of the nanomaterials I was talking about earlier, a gold nanoparticle is just about four nanometers wide. So that means in terms of atoms, it's just about 20 atoms across. So how small can we see with our optical microscope? Well, an optical microscope is limited to a wavelength of about half of the wavelength of the optical light that you're using. So usually optical light has a wavelength of a few hundred nanometers, typically about 500 nanometers would be greenish light. And so we can typically see things that are the order of 100 nanometers or so in the optical microscope. And this is illustrated here. It's a little bit like um, if you have a water boatman on a pond, then it will make ripples. And the ripples are a similar size to the body of the water boatman. If you had a, a water boatman on the ocean, you couldn't see the fact that the water boatman was on the ocean by looking at the waves landing on the shore. And that's because the waves in the sea have a wavelength of a few meters. On the other hand, you could look at the waves landing on the shore and you could see if there was a large oil tanker passing the shore because they are affected by the, um, by the, the wavelength of the water because the water is a few meters and the shipping tanker is hundreds of meters long. Okay, so we said that we can't see atoms using the optical microscope because they're simply too small. The wavelength of our optical microscope was a few hundred nanometers and the size of our atom was uh, less than a nanometer. So we have to use an electron microscope. And why is that better? Well, an electron has a charge and that means that we can accelerate an electron through a potential difference, through a voltage drop, and we can accelerate it to speeds that are just fractions of the speed of light. And when electrons are traveling that fast, they have a, a very small wavelength. And that means that we can see things that are very, very small. So here we've got some images taken of the materials I mentioned earlier, but now they're taken in a scanning electron microscope rather than with a camera. Here we can see those nanoparticles in, uh, inside the gold. We can see these ones have a range of sizes between a few nanometers and a few tens of nanometers. And this is what the inside of your pencil is going to look like in the um, scanning electron microscope. So how does that work? Well, we have an electron beam. This is the electron beam that's shown here. And we scan that electron beam across the surface of the specimen. And at every single point the electron beam passes, we detect the electrons that are being emitted from the material. So that's what we can see here illustrated. We've got electrons being emitted from the material and near to the electron probe. These are detected and they form a signal. Now, where more electrons are being emitted and they reach the detector, the image will appear brighter. But the electrons are being emitted from a relatively large volume. And that means that we can't get atomic resolution. We can't see individual atoms within the scanning electron microscope. In order to get down to being able to see individual atoms, one of the tricks we can do is to make the material very thin. And then we can detect electrons that pass through them. And this is a much smaller interaction volume and therefore we get a much better resolution. So using that, we can take the scanning transmission electron microscope and we can see atomic structures. And many of you may recognize the atomic structures we've got here. This one on the right is uh, very well known. It's the structure of graphene. And each one of these single uh, white dots is an individual carbon atom in the graphene lattice. On the left, we've got a nanoparticle. And this is a metal nanoparticle, a gold nanoparticle. And if we look here, we can see the atoms that are um, within this material. And I said before that a four nanometer uh, diameter metal nanoparticle would have about 20 atoms across. And you can actually look at this image and we can count the number of atoms across for a diameter of four nanometers in a metal nanoparticle. And it is indeed about 20. 
So how does that work? Well, the scanning transmission electron microscope works in a similar fashion to the ele scanning electron microscope, only now we're detecting the electrons that have passed through the material because it's very thin. So if we have a look at what we're doing there, where the atoms are, the electrons are being scattered. So the atoms interact with the electron beam and cause the electron path to change direction and be scattered away from the original direction. We can detect the scattered electrons by using this annular or donut shaped detector, which detects electrons that have been scattered and doesn't detect electrons that have passed straight through. So this is the pass straight through beam. And that means that where we've got atoms, the electron beam will be scattered and hence when we're detecting the scattered electrons we'll see a bright spot in the image and I showed you that in the previous slides. On the other hand if we form the image using the unscattered beam the directly transmitted beam will end up having spots that appear dark where there are atoms and that was the sort of image that I showed you at the beginning of the coronavirus which was formed using the unscattered electrons. Now this is another image formed using the scattered electrons and so you can see most of it is dark except where the atoms are. Now this is a material that's a little bit like graphene, only instead of just having carbon atoms, now we have atoms of molybdenum and of sulfur. Now the structure of that is shown here. We, in each of the individual spots in this image, we either have a molybdenum atom or we have two sulfur atoms. Now these have a slightly different brightness and that's because the molybdenum atom scatters the electron beam more than the two sulfur atoms. And that's to do with the atomic number of the material. So I can show you now a video taken from the paper that you can see cited here. And this is a video showing uh, imaging of molybdenum disulfide. And now we're not just taking an image, but we're taking a movie. You can see the, this image is being built up by an electron beam scanning across the whole area very, very quickly, several times per second. And what you see in this movie is that the structure is quite dynamic. It's moving and rearranging under the action of the electron beam. And after a certain amount of time or a certain amount of electron dose, we start to see a hole opening up in this single layer material. So I can show you that here. We can see that we've lost both molybdenum and sulfur atoms from this region. And the sulfur atoms migrate away and they leave this buildup of molybdenum and that's what's this bright region here now this is more of a metallic region it's a pure molybdenum area so under the action of the electron beam that continues to enlarge and eventually we end up with this rather beautiful molybdenum bridge structure and molybdenum disulfide is very interesting it's an ultra thin semiconductor and one of the potential applications of this type of understanding is that the molybdenum metal could be used to contact and do electronics in the semiconducting molybdenum disulfide material. I should say that this image is used, is made using a scanning transmission electron microscope. And an example of a scanning transmission electron microscope is shown here. This is one of our smallest users. Um, he's not very good. Okay, so Hopefully that's um, something you'll see, this, the imaging is, is rather beautiful, it's rather intriguing. But why are we doing this? Okay, so um, a few years ago, there was, uh, an, I was looking around, thinking about what I might want to do, and I had a look at one of these well-known careers magazines, and the careers magazine is shown here, uh, looking in glamour, and they were doing a, a special issue. And they had suggestions for jobs that people might be doing in the future. So the options were the virtual architect, the avatar stylist, the active makeup developer, graphene engineer and body part farmer. And as you can see, I've circled the graphene engineer as being something which is um, uh, was a future option. So it says here that for a graphene engineer, that scientists are experimenting with this ultra thin, ultra strong material. It's very versatile. It may be possible to build a very tall building or make a straw which will filter out impurities from water, potentially saving millions of lives in developing countries. And I'm very fortunate that I've been able to work in the last decade with people who have been trying to build ultra strong materials using graphene, ultra strong, ultra light materials with graphene, which have applications maybe not in construction of buildings, but certainly in making 
very light, very efficient aeroplanes or drones. I've also worked with people who are developing membranes that can be used to filter out impurities from water or to filter out very valuable chemicals or elements which can be used for um, a huge range of applications, including um, water security. So just to remind you the many, many properties of graphene are illustrated here. It's extremely thin, it's extremely strong, very stiff, very stretchy, very conductive, both for um, electricity and for heat. It's uh, very impermeable and it's almost entirely transparent. And that has led to a huge range of potential applications from electronics, drug delivery, and sensing, as composites, as I mentioned, in things like planes and vehicles. Energy, it's a really important component in batteries and supercapacitors, particularly where you want those to be lightweight and portable. It's crucial in membranes, and there are many very exciting opportunities where membranes can be used to improve the efficiency of chemical processes. So these are some examples of graphene materials that were lying around the lab a few months ago. And um, I wanted to leave you with this talk with the message that materials are key to our future. And in order to optimize and engineer the properties of new or existing materials, we need to do advanced characterization. And that is absolutely a key part of material science and materials engineering. So to finish, I'd like to thank all of my group and all of the many people that I'm fortunate to work with here at Manchester and around the world. This is an image of my group this year. And I'd like to thank the funding agencies without whom this wouldn't be possible. And of course, you for your attention. Thank you very much. <laughs>